Starting here. Oh. <laughs> I was like, Liz. Or, Li or Liz. Liz, take it away. Let's go first. Go first. Liz, Liz, Liz. Liz. All right, all right. Uh, my name is Liz Tigelar. I slightly lost my voice. <laughs> I've been not talking all morning to be prepared. Um, I work, I, um, what am I answering? You, you, you just, a couple of shows you've worked on. Oh, okay. I've worked, well, I got my start on, um, as an assistant on Dawson's Creek with Rena. Yeah. And um, um, from there, I worked on American Dreams. I created Life Unexpected. Um, and most recently, I worked on Bates Motel, Nashville Revenge. So no shows that any of us have heard of. <laughs> Working on Astronaut Wives Club, ABC stuff. Nice. Excellent. Uh, my name is Rena Moon. My first assistant job is going to date me. None of you guys will know it. It was on Ned and Stacy. <laughs> yeah, on uh, this place. Yeah, no one has ever known that. Um, and then some of the shows I've done since then: Dawson's Creek, and Everwood, and Jack and Jill, and Gilmore Girls. And then I moved, and I did privileged with my show, and yes. now I'm doing a little thing called Mistresses for ABC. Um, yeah. Again, these are not professionals. Okay. <laughs> Emily. Uh, my name is Emily Halpern. I began my comedy career uh, as a writer's assistant on the hilarious military drama The Unit on CBS. Um, then I wrote for Private Practice uh, for a little while, and then um, most recently with my writing partner, Sarah Haskins, co-created Trophy Wife on ABC. Um, uh, so assistants, right? Like not internships. So you got to start. <laughs> Gotta start a job. Okay, then. Well, we'll get into the internships. We'll get into the internships. Um, I, I guess my first, okay, so I guess my first job was the casting assistant for Law and Order um, back in like 97 when it was the only show in New York. And, um, and after that, I just worked on movies uh, for about 10 years. And then um, some TV stuff started coming along. And I did it. Um, and it was, I guess it was like the Pacific kind of got me into it. And then um, the two that have stuck uh, are um, <laughs> uh, Girls and Orange is the New Black. So um, <laughs> TV with it. So. Quality programming. All right, well, let's get this thing going. So I'm gonna, we'll kind of go chronologically because I feel like that's the natural arc of this panel, to start at the bottom and rise to the successful ladies that you are now. Um, so. I want to talk about how many of you, let's just get a show of hands, because I want to see how many of you are currently seeking assistantships or internships or wanting to get into the business. Raise them high, don't be ashamed of that. We're all weird people. Okay, great, so a good, yeah. She wants to get a great assistantship, so just let her know if there's any openings. Um, so I want to know for you guys, how early in your life did you sort of start sniffing out what you wanted to do? And how early did you start taking real steps to put yourself in a position to do that career? I mean, did you always want to be in entertainment, I guess is the first question. And then what were those early steps, like maybe even in high school and college, that you were doing to position yourself as best you could? Um, yeah, I was like a, a, a like a sick little kid and um, I didn't like going out to play and I, uh, I hate nature so I, um, I watched movies like from the time like three or four my parents loved movies and my grandparents loved movies so it was big in my house and I was obsessed I was obsessed probably by the time I was like seven or eight with movies and television, I, I had like my I would like write out my schedule, my TV schedule and stuff. You know um, when you had to do that? Uh, yeah, to, you had to take the TV guide and, and there was like a whole thing. It, yeah. So, because that was it was before VCRs even, like before we even had like a beta, and um, so uh, so I but it, so I knew I was going to work on films at some some point. I knew that by the time I was like in middle school probably, and then by the time I was in high school, I got really obsessed with film history, uh, film of the '30s and '40s, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Like, was I going to write about film? Was I going to be um, an editor or a screen supervisor, a script supervisor? I never wanted to act. Like, acting was never on the table like I can't even look out right now so it's like <laughs> I'm like just gonna look this way um I don't like this is pretty lots of people yeah <laughs> um so that was never a thing but and I just got in so that's so that's where it started it was pretty much like as far back as I can remember. Being a big remember. consumer of media and loving it. It was an escape it was the only thing that like gave me joy and like happiness you know and sort of a volatile 
uh, you know, uh, world and home life and school life and stuff. You know, it was just an, it was a total escape, and I loved it. And I loved these actors that were taking me there, and I remembered them all. You know, so I had a, my mom, my, my whole family has a freakish memory for actors and and actresses. Like really, like it's like crazy. Human IMDb's. Yeah, we were, right. and I was like a party trick, like in high school and stuff. Like Jen, who's in this movie? Jen, what movies has this person done? And then when I got hired, there weren't there was no IMDb, so it was literally like the biggest. Oh. Like gift and people were like, Excuse, you just knew that, and I'm just like, oh yeah, why, you know? And then I had books I could like look stuff up in, so it was all it was all good. So that's how it started for me. I was just there was never any question I was going to do anything else. So, yeah. I I also I always knew I wanted to to be a writer, um, and I I also started to learn I think in my late teens or early twenties that I wanted to also make a living at at that. <laughs> so that so it seemed like. A, trying to get a foothold in the industry was a good idea. And I, I think it was, I was like 19 or 20 when I, I was, um, I grew up in Boston and I was a PA on um, this David Mamet film, State in Maine, that had come to film there. And that was really my very first anything. And PA is like really low on the totem pole and you're just fetching things. But it, but you know, I met a lot of people and made good connections and then it was a little while later I was hired to work part time as Mamet's assistant and then uh, stayed with him for several years and, and um, and several years later, you know, when he got uh, the unit on the air, that that was you never you really never know when you sort of the break is going to come. And I was sort of trying to make inroads in between that, but that came and I was hired as a writer's assistant on that show, and then eventually a writer. I think I unfortunately did think I was going to act. <laughs> Quickly realized that was disastrous. Like that's what I studied in college, and that's what I thought I was going to do. And then I came out here, and I went on my first. I got an internship at this. That's actually the same thing. I got an internship at this management company that also made films. It was Baumgarten Profit Entertainment. <laughs> for Craig Baumgarten, who had made Jade, like really fine films. <laughs> but I was like, I was an intern there, and so they let me go to a movie set for the first time. And as soon as I got there, I was like, oh, this is horrible. I hate this. I, could n I don't want to be on a set. I don't want to. It was just everything about it was wrong. So <laughs> I had started writing in college a little bit, and then I took this UCLA extension class. This, as soon as I graduated, I just went right back to college. I took this extension class for writing the television sitcom. I was like, mm, I like this. So then I wrote <laughs> seven of them. <laughs> I wrote a King of the Hill and a Dharma and Greg and a Mad About You. And I just kept writing it until the guy who I was interning for finally said, all right, I'll help you. I'll hook you up. And, <laughs> and then he sort of got me into the uh, Ned and Stacy thing. It was kind of cool. I also wanted to, oh my god, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. I also wanted to be an actress. Um, I was horrible. And, but I really wanted to specifically be a soap opera actress, yes. was what I wanted, <laughs> specifically on Days of Our Lives. So being horrible <laughs> is kind of okay then. Yeah, you yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. I wanted to be a soap opera actress. Jenny and I were actually college roommates who both were obsessed Stories with there. Days of Our Lives. <laughs> we were. We would like, <laughs> we lived at Oakwood Home with the Stars in LA and we, you had to rent all your furniture and a, like a TV yeah. and we th and we threw an extra to rent yeah. a VCR yeah. so we could not only tape Days of Our Lives <laughs> but watch our old tapes of Days of Our Lives. <laughs> I was also really into gymnastics and Jen was really into Xena Warrior Princess so we would have like yes. she would watch a little gymnastics I would watch yeah. a little Xena yeah, and then we'd like cap like, it off you know, with like Jack challenge. and Jen's wedding yeah. 91. Um, so I really want to be a soap opera actress. I decided to go to Ithaca College because they had an awesome soap opera called Semesters that I was like, I will be the star. Um, and then when I got there, I forgot that I wanted to do that and I joined the crew team. Because <laughs> I also had never been on a sports team before and it felt like the only thing you could join, but I'm really unathletic, so I had to be the coxswain. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the really good thing. I thought that was. No, I was like so impressed by that. Quality. Quality. You know what? It did. It was really yeah. staring at a bunch of really big people with oars. Yeah. It was intimidating. It was good preparation. Um, but they said I talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> The feedback I got, I'd be like, "What should we eat for dinner? Let's go to TGI Fridays." Da -da -da. And they're like, "We're working out. You're sitting there, <laughs> bitch." Yeah. So okay. anyway, I did that, and then. Um, uh, yeah, I was like, I'm not going to act. I don't know what to do, blah, 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 blah. And um, maybe I'll write. So um, I, I got in, I'm trying to think. We, I, I, can't, I know what it was. I can't, yeah, I interned at General Hospital where all the Days of Our Lives people were now working because they were off Days of Our Lives in General Hospital. It's a really good strategy. And I was like, this is amazing. And then 
just as I did these internships, um, one of the places I got an internship was Dawson's Creek right after I graduated, and it just felt like, um, and it was before the WB was really anything. Actually, when I was on the crew team, my friend Zaida would always be like, you guys, we gotta get home. Dawson's Creek is on. Like, we gotta get back to the dock. And we'd be like, all right, sister, sister, calm down. Like, da 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 We didn't know what, that's the only show we knew on the WB. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Dawson's Creek? And so I came out and I was like, ugh, there's some show, Dawson's Creek, blah, blah, blah. It's like some WB show on that like weird network. and um. And I brought home all the tapes, because I was back living at Oakwood and had rented a VCR again. And I brought home all the VHSs to watch. And I was like, oh my god, this is the best show ever. <laughs> I completely oh, love this. Oh and I ended up interning there. And then that turned into my first job. But you always were writing in a room. I mean, yeah, I you, guess were, I was. you were always writing in your yeah. journal or something. I just always remember I know. you. There's a lot of crying and writing. writing. Well, no, yeah. there was a lot of writing. I, just remember I was just, working yeah. it out. <laughs> No, but I did always like Our writing. beds were like next to each other. It was like a sad, you know, it was situation. a very small Yeah, show. it was just like we were literally yeah, like next to each other. So we had really terrible roommates. That, that one girl had like, she had pictures of penises she, all over her. She was horrible. Like, it was very She was really horrible. It, it was disgusting. Yeah, but I remember her writing because Lizzie writes very specifically with her, the way her hand is. So I, I she says, a, no, she does. Oh, my pen She weird. does. You know, she, okay. So I always remember her writing in her bed and I was like, awesome. You know, and then when you did it, I was like, yeah, <laughs> we did. We did what we came to do. Yeah. Did yeah. you write on Dawson's? I can't remember. I wrote a freelance. I wrote this episode after this really good episode that Gina Fattori had written. This like Rashomon episode. There was an episode. Oh, I love. We, that. I know everybody loved that episode. That I wrote the one right after that. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. That was a tough back to tough. It was a tough. There was a boat race. And yeah. all. It's fine. Your crew experience coming through. I did. Race. I did. It's I was like, wait up, wait up. <laughs> Well, um, that, that kind of leads me to the next point, which you each kind of touched on a little bit, but maybe kind of if you can go into a little bit more in depth of what was your first real Hollywood thing and how did you actually get it? I mean, I know it's easy to say, and then I got this job on, right. on Dawson's Creek, but what exactly were kind of the, the few steps leading up to that, that moment where you got the job? I think for me, it is sort of, it was getting an agent was the very was the very first thing because with, with Ned and Stacy it was actually it wasn't a writer's assistant job it was something that doesn't even exist anymore they used to have these WGA internships where the WGA would put you on a show for six months but even to get that internship like you had to know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody so I had I got this internship with the Craig Baumgarten people <laughs> which had nothing to do with television at all from that the guy who I was interning for Todd Hoffman sent my stuff to an agent at Writers and Artists, because I had, was specking my face off. She signed me out of pity, I think, but she knew this one woman, so the agent got me a meeting with this woman, Jeannie Bradley, who was at the time running uh, Sony, who was lovely, and it was funny, because they were just making Dawson's. They were developing the pilot of Dawson's Creek. She made me watch the pilot of Dawson's Creek, but I, at that point, was a comedy writer. All of my specs were half hours. I had no intention of being in soaps. I had no clue about soaps, at hilarious, as it turns out, my entire career. <laughs> but <laughs> Dawson's, everyone, blah, blah, blah. But um, anyway, Jeannie was the one who read my script and said, I can get you an internship here if you want to do it. And so I put on a polka dot dress, which is the thing that I really now remember, because P.S., don't wear dresses to <laughs> interviews. Terrible idea. But I had no idea because I was 21. So I put on this polka dot dress and I went to meet Michael Whitehorn, who is the king of queens, the king of comedy. And I was like, hi! And he felt so bad for me. <laughs> I literally felt so bad for me, but I was free. So he was like, sure, come on the show. And the one thing I remember about it was he didn't think I was going to do anything but sit there, which I sort of thought was going to be the same thing too. And the writer's room was was a nice big room and there was the writer's table and all the writers were at the writer's table and there was this couch in the back. And he's like, why don't you just hang out there? So I was like, sure. So the first day I hung out on the couch and I immediately knew, I was like, well, this no good will come from this. I have to figure out how to move up. So then the next day I brought a chair to the couch so that the chair was sort of a little bit in front of the couch. And then the third day I moved the chair in between the writer's <laughs> table and the couch, never talking, ever. <laughs> Just slowly inching the chair forward, <laughs> like wondering if anyone would notice. 
<laughs> and finally, again, Michael Whitehorn, who took great pity on me, was like, just sit here. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I sat at the table and I got one muffin joke in that I still remember. <laughs> yeah, and I felt really, really proud of myself. But that was, that's my first memory of, it is, tr it's, it's, the internships help because someone at the internship might like you or take pity on you and just introduce you to the right person who's gonna read you. That's, that's what happened for me. Jen, what, or, yeah, Emily, what about when you guys? Um, I love that chair story. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, when I first moved out to LA, I, um, I didn't have a job for a little while. Part of it was friends who'd had some success in the industry really encouraged me to come to LA, and even that was kind of a difficult decision for me to make, because just coming out, I, I come from a family of academics, just like moving somewhere with no plan or job is not in our blood, so it was a scary thing to do. Um, and I was temping for a little while and just really reaching out to everybody I knew in the industry, just absolutely everybody. And um, I think it was some like agents or agents assistants and I, I couldn't get signed initially and um, I feel like I just made a ton of calls and emails and some were returned and some weren't and one person who, I mean, I was so lucky to be able to call him was David Mamet who I had worked for and, and it was this crazy serendipitous coincidence um, but he had this show that was just about to get on the air and uh, offered me a job first as his and Sean Ryan's assistant who was the other co-creator and I worked on that um, through the pilot, and then when the show was picked up, I was promoted to writer's assistant. So it, it really, it just was one of those sort of, I do feel like that's a lot of it. Uh, it's, it's always this luck of like, you know, talent and, and, and sort of persistence, but also just luck and serendipity. And that was when it, when it, the stars aligned for me. Um, Cause I really did, I called like everybody I knew. Um, and the people who didn't respond are, are dead to me now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know anybody. I live, I am from, New, um, well, yeah, I mean, but, you know, I lived in New anybody Jersey. Mattered. Right? <laughs> Wait, who? She said anybody that mattered. <laughs> um, I lived in New Jersey and just kind of grew up middle class Jersey and I uh, went to NYU and studied cinema studies and, uh, and anthropology. Um, so that, <laughs> I, I love primates, so, um, uh, and like physical uh, anthropology. Anyway, so, <laughs> I in, and um, I knew that I didn't want to. I wanted to get a job right out of college because I knew I had to pay back so much money for college. So I wasn't going to intern after I got out of college. And I knew that to get my foot in any door or anything because I had nobody. I mean, I, I mean, my mom's a nurse, my dad was a salesman, and it was just like, you're insane. Like nobody from my town. Like everybody just thought I was insane, and uh, they couldn't understand what I was doing with my life. And um, so I interned my ass off in college. Every semester I had an internship everywhere from like ABC, I worked for Joel Siegel, who was like a film critic at the time, and AMC, which was a cool, was like TCM is now, it used to be really cool, um, except besides the original programming or whatever, but they just played old movies without interruption. Um, and then uh, I was a PA on a set, and I had the same reaction to the set. I was like, I, it was like a Miramax movie with Sarah Jessica Parker in the one summer, and I, I wanted to kill myself. It was like the worst thing in my life, but it taught me I'm an office girl. Like uh, whatever's gonna, I'm gonna do, it's gonna be indoors and <laughs> not like and not with like cameras and people and like you know walkies and being like Shh, you know like whatever. So um, so I learned that. So I, by doing the internships, I learned what I really didn't want to do. And then um, I guess the thing that brought me to where I am is. I, um, I've been listening to Howard Stern since I was 12, so I um, love that man and his show, and I've been, you know, religiously, like, religiously listen to him, like, every single morning. I can't wake up without hearing his voice, so. Um, and uh, I was doing my, in my internship letters, because, you know, at that, that time you would just get addresses, like, out of the newspaper or something, you know, it was just, like, insane, like, what you would do. They'd list, like, the, the networks and stuff. Um, and I, uh, I was listening to Howard, and uh, his producer was like, you know, we're looking for interns this semester, send us your resume to the address. And I literally threw a resume in an envelope. I know this is how it used to go. And, um, and uh, just sent it. I didn't even put a cover letter in. I didn't do anything. And uh, his producer, Gary Delabate, called my house. And I was like living with my parents at the time. And my dad answered. And my, I came home and my dad's like, Gary Delabate just called for you. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, and he said that I had a great voice. I'm like, what? And uh, it was just like, my dad was so happy. My dad had a very deep, deep voice, you know, so. 
Um, so he was thrilled, and I was like, what? And so I, they set me up for an interview, and I, I came in, and I, uh, I interviewed, and they, went, they hired me on the spot. Now, you have to understand, this was be- like in, like, 95. So there were no, I was the only girl intern that semester. They didn't do any of their weird, like, intern beauty pageants or the silly stuff that they do now with girls. Um, and they were very protective of me, actually. It was like me and seven guys. So um, I did it. So I, I, I was like, do I do this? I don't, I don't want to work in radio, but I knew he was going to be filming his movie in the spring. So I was like, if I do a good job here. I was very like calculated, apparently, at like <laughs> 20 years old. So I uh, don't know, 19. And uh, I was like, I could probably get an internship on the movie. And that's what I wanted. And I did. So they recommended me to the movie, and uh, I didn't even ask. It was fantastic. So I was a, I was an office PA intern, whatever, on the movie, private parts, and um, just did a lot of like running around, like, collating scripts, and you know stuff that doesn't even like that people don't do anymore. And um, <laughs> and I was waitressing also, like seven days a week. I would like intern waitress. So I had no money. And the people in the production office, like the production coordinators and all these people, they knew I needed money for work, for just life, so um, for survival. So they, they, there were like odd jobs people would call them for. Like, do you have a person to help with this table read, or do you have a person to help with like this open call? And it was all casting stuff. I didn't even know what casting was at the time. And I was like, two hundred dollars? Yes, <laughs> I'll be there at six o'clock in the morning. And um, so I did all those, and I did, and I realized after doing them, like, oh. This, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what all this foolish information is for, you know? And, yeah. and that was the moment when I just had a, it was an epiphany. Yeah. And then from then on, all my internships were in casting, all of them. That's where I met Lizzie. I, when we went, I went up to LA Universal and worked at Universal Television Casting. So that was like my, it was just, it was Howard. I mean, I could, I, I could literally just go back and credit him with everything. So, <laughs> um, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> so. Did you have, Oh, well, mine, mine was, um, uh, did the, so Ithaca has this LA program where I, that I did with Jenny, and then um, I came and did it again right after I graduated, and that's what led to, the, to Dawson's Creek, but the way I got it was that there was an Ithaca alumni who was working, she was Paul Stupin's assistant, and so when I went to the Ithaca office, they were like, reach out to these Ithaca people and they'll help you out, and it was this girl, Ilka. I had been on the crew team with the girl, Elka, and I was like, oh my God, I totally have this locked up. I was, not only was I on the crew team with her, I got in, <laughs> terrible, I got in a fight with another coxswain, not my fault, but I was also sharing a bed with her and she beat the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah, and I got separated from her and I had to go sleep in the bed with this girl, Elka. I mean, she was the only person, we were on spring break, spring training for crew in Georgia. It was very weird. And I had to go, it was midnight when we got in the fight, so they were like, just go sleep with Elka. And I was like, okay. So I crawled in bed with this girl, Elka, who I didn't know, and I was like, hi, Elka, I'm a freshman. I just got beat up. I'm just gonna sleep right here. Anyway, so I'm like, oh my God. So I call Paul Steuben's office. Il- I'm like, Elka, please. Elka picks up and I'm like, Ilka, it's Liz. I was like, we slept together in college on spring break. <laughs> And she was like, no, we didn't. And I was like, weren't you on the crew team? And she's like, wrong Ilka. And I'm like, there are two Ilkas at Ithaca who graduated in 95? Like, what are the chances? So she ended up hiring me, and that's how I got it. But, but in all fairness, you were kind of living an episode of Dawson's Creek or some sort of a soap opera. Yes. So it, but it was actually... <laughs> But it was actually Jeannie Bradley, too, who Jeannie Bradley's daughter, Holly, was a production secretary at Dawson's, and we ended up becoming writing partners. We wrote that boat race episode together, and it was that that got us an agent, and, and we eventually split up, but that was kind of the start for me of like what really got me in as a writer, so it's credit to the same person, Jeannie weirdly. Bradley, she was awesome. Get to know Jeannie Bradley, clearly. Yeah, we'll get her, we'll get her contact Bradley. info for everything. Like, These people who are gonna be applying to be assistants, is it harder now, do you think? Because, I mean, like, Craigslist exists and all these sites and whatever. I guess maybe how do you, what's your channels for going through finding someone and what do you recommend as maybe, like, things that work and things that don't maybe don't waste your time on? I mean, I would imagine a lot of it is you have to, word of mouth of people that you trust. Um, so maybe if, if you, you don't all have to answer, but just maybe a couple of you touch on the process now, how it's changed, and what do you recommend? Well, casting is very different, I think, and very specific, I think, in terms of us trying to hire people, because um, I, 
you usually have to start working on projects immediately, and you need somebody that knows exactly what they're doing, all the agents, knows who to call. I don't have to like sit there and you know hold hands and and teach them what to do for the, for the initial thing, you know? Um, casting to me, as I was brought up in it, was an apprenticeship. You know, I worked for the same person for eight years. So um, that's how I've sort of approached hiring people. And um, it, in casting, it's a very small community. We sort of trade assistants around sometimes and associates. And sort of that's what happened. And I, so I had somebody's assistant uh, for a movie. And then we, we had an intern. Uh, it was like, inter you know, I, I wasn't even paying attention. It was terrible. I, uh, I was like working on two movies and my assistant wanted an intern. I'm like, well, good, find one. I don't care. And um, so she, I guess she was younger. She was like, tw you know, obviously she's younger. She's 20. And I guess her, it was like her roommate's friend or something. So I interviewed a couple people. I was there, present, but I wasn't registering anything. And, um, and I, she's like, who do you want to hire? I'm like, well, just the one with the, with the weird name. That's fine. That's good. Um, her name's Emer O'Callaghan, and she is uh, Irish. Go, Emer, I'm yeah, seeing she's, a theme. She's Irish. Change your name. She's Go. Irish, and uh, her parents, I mean, she's parents are from Ireland, Irish. And um, so she worked for me as an intern, kind of like, and I was just so crazy. I really didn't even talk to her that much. But then I have had some time off. My assistant, Jamie, went to go work for, with my friend Kathleen, and then I got a gig. So I was like, oh, God, what do I do now? You know, like, how do you find somebody? And usually we just email each other and just, like, do you have somebody or whatever? And now there's, like, a thing on, like, Facebook where casting directors, like, can talk to each other and say, if you have a known assistant, let me know. So that's, like, a good resource, I guess. I haven't had to use it, but... So I was like, I'm going to... So I'll bring Emer back, right? Like, I don't know. She seemed nice. And... Um, and she has been with me for almost five years now, and she's amazing. And we just had to hire an assistant about two years ago. And again, I had the same thing. Like a friend of mine had recommended this girl who was moving back to New York. She might want to be in casting. She was an actress. And we interviewed her, and she was like a cute. I had a kind of a memory of her, but not really. And then um, I was like, Emer, we have to hire somebody. She's like, well, what about that girl You know, we met? I'm like, whatever you say like let's just do it so it was through a friend you know so in my job I think it's very word of mouth and so she's been my assistant for two years so um I don't know like if I was want to get into casting now it is the same process though you have to like intern first at least in my world and in New York like you just have to ha know what's going on and just do a good job as an intern and you'll usually get bumped up to an assistant. So And make it a personal mission, I would imagine, to know actors, know what they're doing, have build that knowledge that you kind of came naturally to you. Right. Well, more importantly for an associate or assistant, for me, because uh, I was like totally a control freak and stuff and had a really hard time delegating in the beginning, it was just being organized and doing, and, when I, and if I asked you to do something to do it, and do it perfectly, you know, sort of. <laughs> the person I worked with, her four, it was sort of the same thing. And um, so I, I'm not as, like, you know, as uh, old school, harsh as her, but it was the same thing where it's just like, so yeah, I mean, internships, I don't even know how you would do it now. Like, I, did, I feel like an antique the way I used to do it, so. What about the in the writing game? I mean, obviously, it's a little different with having, you know, work, the specs and things that you've written, but I'm sure that even process has changed. So. Yeah, you guys talk about that. You mean for getting the first assistant job? Yeah, As, yeah, yeah, getting yeah. assistant job. I, I know, at least for us on Trophy Wife, it just it feels like personal connections and word of mouth is is huge. And I, I know, like in hiring our assistants, we had so many people recommend people that it was like we. I think we did get sent a few resumes that we honestly just never looked at because we already had the names of more people than we could hire to begin with. Um, but and I, I think the one thing which is silly, but if you're wanting to get in the writers' room, type. Like, yeah. be a good typist. Yeah. Type fast, because that brings your resume up to the top. Like, I type 90 words a minute. And so that became the word of mouth in my writer's assistant gigs. <laughs> and it comp like definitely led to other things. But it's one of those skills that it actually matters, and it feels really antiquated. But yeah. to be in a writer's room and trying to capture every voice in the room, and if the writers in the room don't hear clicky clack, they think you suck. Mm -hmm. Even if you yeah. are memorizing it all, but it's like they want to know. It's like, did you get that? Did you get that? Did you get my genius? I'm like, yes, and it wasn't genius. Oh. <laughs> it sucked. Yeah. You will read this tomorrow and not be as thrilled with it, and you will yeah. blame me because you will think I didn't get the whole joke, but I fucking did. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah. but it's like part of the writer's assistant. <laughs> I type that, fast. That was it. And I also I think. Also think oh. um, um, I mean, I know what I do is like obviously a lot of work with Ithaca and like I think using if you've gone to college using you know alumni to basically I think it's I think it's a great thing not to reach out and ask them to like read your script or anything but to reach out and say you know I've had a lot of 
students reach out and say like, I'm about to graduate, I'm moving to LA, if you know of anything, and I just keep a file on my computer of like resumes of people I know who are looking, and I've like divided up like PAs, writers assistants, and I just tell them if they get a job to let me know so I can remove them, but I just have a file on my computer at all times, and um, I know on Life Unexpected, the first two, you know, our PA was my college roommate's niece, um, who then went on to be my assistant for like four years. I love her so much. Um, <laughs> I lost her a year ago. I mean, she's still alive. She's on, a, <laughs> she's on Vampire Diaries as a writer assistant now. She's very happy, but I personally have lost her a year ago. I'm like, every day I'm like, Missy. But, um, and then, you know, someone who went to my high school, I hired as my assistant. Like, you know, it, it is just those kind of personal connections. And I think that, um, I think it's always great to reach out in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And I, do, I think all of us, I mean, I know I can probably speak for all of us to say like, we obviously we've all been there. And so I don't ever feel put out to get a resume when it's like, can you read my script? Can we meet up? Can we have coffee? Can we have dinner? Then I'm like, oh God, like I, I don't have time <laughs> to do that with everybody. So I usually am like resume and like a phone call so I can know you and know what you're looking for and I can know who I'm recommending a little bit. And, you know, you obviously are honest whether you've worked with somebody or not before because you don't know how they're going to do if you don't know them. But I think that's a great way to go. I also, I'm sorry, I also think there's like, a, sometimes it's easy to think like, oh, I just got to get my resume into like X showrunner's hands or something. But it, it is also like there's so many young people I know around, like in the case of our assistant who, the, our, the assistant we had on Trophy Wife, I, she and Sarah had gone to high school together, I think different years, and she reached out to Sarah, and yeah, we had a coffee with her, and we needed someone, and that was just timing, and it worked out great. And then after Trophy Wife, we helped her get a job as a writer's assistant on Benched, which now Michaela Watkins is running, and she was just given a script. So in like two years, she went from knowing nobody to now has a writing career. And then when we needed a new assistant, we asked her, and she recommended her friend, who um, is now our assistant, who'd never been an assistant ever, and she just liked him, and we trusted her. And I believe, I don't want to get this wrong, he was working in an ice cream shop before we <laughs> hired him. <laughs> um, but he's great. And so I, I think like even it was just her friendship with him and suddenly now he's working with us. And I, I do think just meeting anybody with like-minded interests, it can sort of surprise you when that connection helps you out. Yeah, but if you don't know anybody, because like that's yeah. a, that's a luxury. Like I think that yeah. you guys had that I did not have, yeah. and it was so scary. You know, I had nobody to call. Like yeah. it was just like so. What my thing was was the internship, and I know again, I know this is like an assistant thing, but that was like the most invaluable thing I could have ever done. It's like yeah, you're working for free, and you're doing some pretty like terrible things that maybe you do not want to do. But if you do, you know, one of my um, first people that I was an intern for, she said you know, work like nobody's watching you, you know, like work so hard, like the, just, just, they'll notice, people will notice if you work hard, you know, and people just want to give you stuff. Yeah. If you do, so if just, you do your job, just people do, want to do give it you really well and they'll notice. And she was right, you know, and that's what I did. And maybe it's a little more like high tech now because there's like the internet and you can't just like mail a resume. It's not going to really end up where you want it to be. But I mean, there still has to be that, that, the internship structure, if you have it in your school or whatever. I mean, NYU had one, but it really wasn't that good. I didn't use it. I went out on my own because I wanted my internships to be noted. Like, I wanted my resume when I came out of college to be, like, places that people knew, not, like, random student movies and, you know, student films and things. I wanted it like, to be, like, like, names and brands and stuff that you would know coming out of college. So I took my own interests, and I reached out to them. And even if it was like, I mean, you could probably still do this now. Like, you could probably just call like a network or something like that, and call Human Resources, or you know, you never know what's going to happen. So you just sort of, you just have to put yourself out there and be willing to do, you know, to be to work hard and to do it for free for a little while until you do get that person that's like, oh, okay, now I know you. Now I'm going to recommend you to somebody else. You know, well, I think it's so important. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing is you can feel like you don't know anybody, kind of of note, but the best like. I always know whenever whenever I know people are looking for assistant jobs, I don't email my friends who are showrunners to ask. I email my friends who are assistants and people I've worked with because assistants know assistant jobs and assistants have a network. So you can think, oh, I don't know anybody, but you can look to somebody who graduated one year before you, see what they're doing in LA, and they're going to be really tapped knowledgeable, in. Yeah. tapped in, willing to help you because they were just in that position. It's like they're not already... 12 years out from that and don't remember that scary feeling. So, I mean, I know on Dawson's is a good example. We were like a little pack of assistants that now, you know, 12 years later, everyone's... Here, 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 running 
Yeah. yeah, and it's like it's like the it's the connections with the other assistants that mattered so much less the higher level writers. So. Well, it's interesting too because I mean, obviously, with entertainment, there's so much turnover so quickly. People who are at one company at one point in a couple months could be somewhere else. Somebody who's not ahead of anything can suddenly be ahead of something. So it sounds to me like the general consensus is just relationships, 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 and working hard. And then those dots eventually connect. And mm -hmm. as long as you put out there what you want to do, yeah. then and just keep letting people know that, then it'll kind of all come to fruition. Um, OK, I want to kind of go just um, to maybe Possibly a dark place, but a funny dark place. Um, we'll do our Devil Wears Prada moment here, where I just want to hear uh, possibly maybe a story from when you were coming up in the ranks, where you thought you may never work in this town again because of some thing that you did, or some mishap that happened, or some thing where you thought your life was over. And, uh, but obviously everything's okay. But if anybody has a funny, it may not even have to be yours, but if there maybe was <laughs> an assistant one. tale that, that is kind of a legendary one that you know of. I didn't think my life would be over because I did have some, I was working, so after my internship, I, I did my internship and then I got a, a job at this place that doesn't exist anymore called the HBO Workspace. And it was this teeny tiny theater that did all these little shows. It was like a black box theater, and back then HBO was still doing the Aspen Comedy Festival, and they would sort of have these free showcases for people who are Jack Black, did a bunch of them <laughs> pre being Jack Black. And so I sat in this tiny, tiny office, and I would like read submissions and make the programs, and that was pretty much for these people that were coming in. But the guy I worked for was so, it was really like, I could see the writing on the wall. I'm like, this job is not, you know, happening. <laughs> this is not, I'm not going anywhere from here per se, but they're paying me $300 a week and that's fine and I can write and do my own stuff while I'm here. Except the guy that I worked for every day made me go to Panda Express oh. to stand online at the Pavilion Supermarket oh. at Panda Express to get his orange chicken. And it was one of those things where I wasn't technically his assistant. I worked for the workspace. So there were all these other bosses, but he was the only one who was constantly making me schlep to Panda Express on my little lunch break, too. So I remember I had roommates at the time, and I was like, I don't want to go to Panda Express anymore. I hate it. I don't get to eat. I don't, if I don't eat the Panda Express, then I don't get to have lunch because I have to get his lunch. And she was like, well, you should say something to him. And I remember I really thought about it, and I was like, I don't want to be that person because I agree. Like the whole thing you have to be as an assistant is super smiley and grateful to be there and you're worthless and the person you work for is God and like that's how you make it. But this guy was not God. And I knew in my heart that this guy was never going to be, you know. It would be better for him <laughs> if he wasn't eating food. Yes, it was bad. terrible. So I finally went to him. <laughs> saved his life. I saved his life and I went up to him and like almost near tears was like, I don't think it's my job to get you lunch. I wasn't disgusted, and I said all of this, and he looked at me, and he's like, my time is more valuable than your time. And I literally remember, I was like, I don't think it is. And I said that, which I, in that moment, I was like, dead, I'm fired. I'm so fired. This is so over. And then I apologized and immediately ran away and was horrified, and I called my roommates. I'm like, I'm totally fucking fired. But the woman who actually what, who worked there was Annie Albrecht, who was Chris Albrecht's wife, and she liked me. <laughs> so, so it all, so Steve eventually got worked out of the place and I was there with Annie Albrecht and it was all, it was all fine. But yeah. I did think I was going to die when I said, I disagree. Just I out. just slipped out. I'm like, it's not, it's not more valuable. I know it's not. <laughs> I know one day my time is going to be more valuable than your time and I can't wait for that day. <laughs> it's not now. But I, thought. I think part of an, it, it being an assistant, at least I found, was like a lot of time of like knowing you're right and someone else is wrong and treating you badly and just being quiet about it for like a little while. Um, I have kind of a crazy story. When... Um, so after like years of different PA jobs, like it started with state and Maine, but then I would sort of bop around like Boston and just try and get myself in on and PA job, like some of them were fine. It's, you're just, it's scut work. It's not fun. And you're just having to run around all the time and wear these like belt. It's very unfeminine, <laughs> like terrible. But yeah, the walkie talkies. <laughs> it was like, once I learned. Up here is like, hello. Yeah. 
What's I also, the eighty? What's, what's your what's your nine? What's your, what's your ten? What's your ten to twenty? Yeah. What's your twenty? Is where are you? And oh, then I remember hitting a point. Um, I'm ten one. Is I'm in the bathroom, yes. and that became my gut. Like I was like walking, and I was just like, I'm ten one. I was just like always <laughs> ten one. <laughs> I was like, I think they thought she I had like a problem? urinary tract infection or something. <laughs> always, always ten one. Um, but I um. Really I, powerful with that belt on, though. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I really did. Like, I had jean shorts on. You know, it's like the oh 90s. And the I worst. was like, in like a tank top, and I'm like, yeah, uh, <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, um, uh, so, it was like a few years, um, I was still in college at the time, and I got a call from, because I'd worked on this David Mamet film, but David Mamet's office, his then like full time assistant, and he was looking for a part time assistant to come in and work in the office just like a couple days a week. And this was just like perfect for me. And I really wanted to be a writer. And just I was such a fan of Mammoth. And this just felt like if I can make a good inroad, make a good impression here, that it could be something that could like long term um, work out for me. And then because I was in college, this story is so, uh, this is nothing like me. It really is an <laughs> anomaly. But I got so drunk the night before my interview. Um, and it was sort of part of this initiation. Like I would never have done this. Um, and the next morning I woke up and I was, I was, felt so gross that I thought maybe I wouldn't go, but like that's obviously not a good way to make a good impression, everyone. So I, um, so I did go and I, I sort of didn't appreciate in what rough shape I was in. Um, and I basically, the short version is while I was in there for my interview, I threw up like in the office and it was... It was so awful. It was so awful. It was like a little bit on the floor and then I had to run into the bathroom. And then um, I l drink responsibly. This is not like a pro drinking <laughs> but, but I left literally beyond humiliated and like I blush, I'm probably brush blushing now. It was just the whole, it was horrific. It was so horrific and I, I left thinking like that, that like, well, law school it is. Like that's obviously <laughs> not gonna happen. Um, and cra I will say, I don't think this would work for everyone. It worked for David Mamet. He, he thought it was funny. He liked it. Um, I did it, so I got the job that way. I, so, I, I don't know. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. I accidentally wrote... Um, uh, well, it was, it was unfortunate, because when I got the assistant job on American Dreams, they wanted to start this um, guy, Mike Foley, who's an amazing writer and one of my dear friends, they, we were both hired as assistants together, but they wanted to start him three weeks ahead of me because they didn't need both assistants at once. And because I'd been an assistant before and he hadn't, I was like, what? I was like, I don't want to come three weeks late, have some guy have organized every, like, oh, no, it's not going to be my system. Like, he's never done it before. Like, I need to be there. So I was like, I'll work for free for three weeks. I don't care. Um, so I showed up like a crazy person, and they were like, okay. Um, and I was like, here's how you do things. And I'm like, da 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 da, -da get it all. And then I'm like, castless, da 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 da. And I um, put out a script that said Vagina Madsen. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I was like, and then he came in and he was like, did you mean to write Vagina Madsen or Virginia Madsen? And I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh my God. I like hid under my desk. <laughs> I also forwarded a really personal email. I was trying to <laughs> forward it to somebody with a last name W, but I accidentally forwarded it to writer's room notes that was all the producer. So it was like a thing. All in the Auto three weeks, film, I wasn't supposed to be there. So it was like so stupid. But it all, it all, it, it, it all worked out. It all worked out. <laughs> I did a lot of other dumb things, but that was, I also got the other little like hell story I had was I worked for this kind of intense boss on Dawson's when I was a post PA. When I was an intern, I became a post PA and I didn't know anything about post. And um, this woman like really, really, really scared me and she didn't want to hire me, but I was an intern and Paul Steuben liked me and she'd want to hire her niece. And so it was like a whole thing. But anyway, I got hired and she hated me and um, she would constantly prank. I, I would do a lot of just I would make a lot of like fucked up mistakes just on my own. But and every time she would be like, strike one, strike two, and I'd be like, oh my god. And I would just sit down, I would sit down in the parking garage just crying. I'd mix up FedEx and UPS. I'd be like, done. And then they'd be like, where the daily? And I'd be like, what? And I'd be like, wait a minute, those are two different mailboxes. But anyway. So she sent me, you used to have to go to Encore Video. You'd have to like every morning as a post PA, you'd have to pick up the dailies. They'd be on like V8, it was like a whole thing. 
And she told me to pick up a box of sprocket holes. And I was like, okay. So I went. I didn't know sprocket holes. I didn't know. They're just the things in the holes in the sides of film. But she was like, I need a box of sprocket holes immediately. I need you to go to Encore. And I was like, okay. And she's like, this is third strike and you're out. And I was like, oh my God. So I like drive to Encore. I'm like, ah, you know, drive down there. And I rush in and I'm like, I need a giant box of sprocket holes, please. And they were like in on it. And they're like, do you want a small, medium, or large? And I'm like, what? And I'm like, you know, it's back when like you don't have a cell phone, you have a pager. And so you're like, oh my God, can I borrow your phone? No? Okay, I'll go to a pay phone. And I'm like, hi, I'm sorry is it a small box, a medium box, or a large one? And they're just all like, you're an idiot. And I'm like, I am. So it was rough. We're blessed to have you here yeah. on a panel. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jen, do you have any um, cray crays? Unfortunately, a lot of mine involve people that are, you would know. And um, You don't have to use names. It's still you would, right. you would figure out who it was. Um, so the answer on, is yes, there are those on movies. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, yeah, you would figure it out. I mean, it happens to everybody. You can't sure. really avoid it. You know, you, you, it, but uh, we are human. Puking doesn't happen to everybody. I'm gonna well, say no. Puking in that's the, road the best is rare. story. No, kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In a sour. Yeah, and it, it's more about stories of like really huge celebrities and stuff and just the ways they are. The ways they are. <laughs> and you kind of lot. can't believe it. <laughs> and it's shocking. And I, every time I say so, like, it's like, you know, my family, obviously, I, I'm very close to my family. We talk a lot. And I'll say something. And I'll be like, and this for, it's, and they're like, no. And I'm like, you know, it's just like, it's an ongoing thing that's been going on for 20 years. Shattering and ruining yeah. people's it, perceptions. Yeah, totally. People. I do that all the time. Like, somebody's yeah. like, oh, I love this person. I'm like, really? Let me tell you this way. <laughs> Fucking douche. <laughs> And then he did this. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it's a lot of with the little celebrity stuff, it's a lot of them not um, carrying money, which I find shocking. So when I was an assistant, like, if I had a session where, like, the star of the movie was in it, and say he was hungry, um, <laughs> and I was supposed to, in the middle of like, a casting session, get him food, um, it wasn't like, oh, let me give you, you know, the money. It's just like, go get my food. And... I'm making like six hundred dollars a week, and <laughs> it's just that thing of them not being in a real world, you know, and not understanding how things work. And I don't think I, some of them are mean. Some of them are they just they're just totally ignorant. It just they've been a star for so long they have no idea how to function. So um, it's 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 fascinating sociologically. It's fascinating. <laughs> like they they could be very nice people too it doesn't doesn't make them bad people it just makes them completely clueless you know and and you know usually a lot of the times the bigger movie stars are the nicer people like that's what you find out in a, in a weird way it's like the biggest directors and the biggest movie stars are actually the nice ones the ones that are kind of mid level are the real jerks, you know, and the real dicks who just like have like insecurities and whatever. So, um, but like people management must be crazy part of being. Oh consistent. yeah, in casting. casting. Yeah, sure. well, you're always trying to make sure everybody's okay and everybody's right. comfortable and somebody's here and somebody has to get there and everybody's in the right place and everybody has the right sides and you know stuff like that. So it's you're constantly um, on your toes, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I luckily I haven't had any like really horror stories. I mean, some it, like projects have been horrible. And I've hated some directors that Liz knows about. Um, and so, and I've either quit those or you just kind of power through, you know. I quit a lot. And, um, no, I do. And I'm like, and I never thought I would be, like, I, you know, I was raised, like, never be a quitter, you know. And it got to the point where since something was, like, so wrong with some, the project I was working on, um, the people were so sort of unethical. I was like, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to leave. And I don't care what happens. Like, burn the bridge, you know? You have to, like, stay true to yourself no matter what. It's like, that's what I was raised on. And I, like, and I do it to, like, the nth degree. To the point where, like, my assistants get so scared. Like, when I, se when I send emails, they're like, did you send it? You know? And I'm just like, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, like, they're, they, like, I think it's because I'm from, like, the tri-state area. And, like, I'm from New Jersey. And I'm like, I'll just go, I'll go off on people, you know? <laughs> And um, my, assist my associate, Eber, is from, like, Texas and went to UPenn, and she's very, like, refined. And she'll be like, let me look at it first. And, like, <laughs> I'll just tone it down just, a just, little. Just like, maybe take out this sentence, you know, because you don't need to tell them that, you know. And, um, and then when I do it without telling them, they get so scared. Like, they freak out. And I'm just like, but usually I'm right. See, the thing is, like, I'm right. 
this just has happened last week. It's like I got into, it wasn't a fight. Somebody did something wrong by me, an agent and a director, and I I called the agent, who's one of my very good friends, and just totally, you know, just put her in her place. <laughs> and um, I did the same thing with the director. And the next, then you know, and my and my assistants were in the room when I was having this conversation, and they were, and I could just feel them like, like <laughs> coiling at every word I was saying. Um, and <laughs> and then um, and then I did a whole email to the to the director. And um, but I was right. Like I felt very like you know I knew I was right, and like got flowers the next day from both of them. And I said to the <laughs> girls, I'm like, see, like. <laughs> If you're right and if you're true, like you say, let's say the truth, like that's all that matters. But like that's the only thing I can say is just that you know, you just have to be just do things with integrity, and it's hard to do in this business. I know that, and but I would never not do it like that because I couldn't live with myself, you know. Yeah. So well, one point, I mean, we're, we're about to open up to questions, but just a, a comment on kind of what you mm -hmm. said. It you, you do have to have a, a real level of trust with these assistants, and they're people that not just get intimately involved in your professional life, but you are with these people all, all the time. time. <laughs> so it does have to be somebody, like you said, that you can kind of hang with and yeah. you can, you know, trust to be in a room with that privileged information in that moment where, you know, you know, they're and learning. And tell me to shut yeah. up and I'm like, oh, you're right, okay? Yeah. You're so right. I'm like, Emer, hold me back. Yeah. So. Um, well, let's open it up to some questions before we wrap it up here. Yeah, in the back. Uh, Jennifer, when you were working for Howard Stern, mm -hmm. you didn't know that you were going to work on private parts. Can you talk about how you uh, decided to drop, hey, can I work on your movie? I didn't, actually. I um, Gary Gary and I became friends. His producer, Gary Delabate, he's a big movie buff. And back in the day, you know, we trade... Um, we trade like VHS tapes and like she, like because I had a big movie collection and so so did he so like we'd like trade tapes and stuff so we knew how much I loved movies and I wanted to work on film so at the end of the internship like in December he's like you know they're gonna start um, hiring people like interns on the movie do you want to do it and I was like yeah you know and so so there was a, th a few months before the internship that Howard actually hired me for, like hired me paid me to work on a second book. I did a lot of like transcribing, and it was paid work, um, and that was like my first credit. I was like in the back of Amer uh, Cap uh, Miss America, his second book. It's like he did the special thanks, and it's like two rows of names, and like my name's in it. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I, I did. I was like, this was I was shaking. It was like it was like whatever, but it was really Gary just knowing me, and like you know, just if you have a good rapport with somebody, and he just he j I didn't ask for it. I just like. You know, because that's the other thing too. You have to be very careful when you're assistant about overstepping boundaries, and I never did, and I think that helped me a lot. I still stood out, but I didn't like, you know, I wasn't annoying. I didn't pester people, and I got what I wanted. So, you know, it was just, but it was just becoming friends with somebody and just like, getting to know you. You know, make yourself as hireable, rehireable. Yeah, as yeah, just do a really good job. You know, so. Yeah, right here in the front. Uh, you had mentioned the dress comment. <laughs> As women, do you guys have issues when you go to me, went to your first interviews and everything with how you're perceived versus what you bring to the table? Uh, yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was especially when, you know, I was trying to get into the comedy world, which is all, all men, and they would have to hire a woman. So you were like, let's be the one girl that they'll hire. So, because you said you did start, or you wanted to, somehow you went from I started from the in drama, but I wife. also, you, I have a story about this too. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it, it, like, I, so I knew the polka dot dress was wrong on every <laughs> level, by the way. It was not a good dress for any occasion. But <laughs> looking back, it was a big mistake. But then when I, that was, so, so then my first writer's assistant job after Ned and Stacy was on Men Behaving Badly. And there was a woman there, Stacy Lip, who I don't even think she's a writer anymore. She was a lampoon person. But she was the one who said to me, in totally serious, she said, never wear pink, never wear a dress. Mm. She's like, that's it. She's like, if you meet a woman, never wear pink, never wear a dress. For sure if you meet it, but it was like, and I took it to heart. I honestly don't know if it's true. I'm sure I've hired people in dresses. <laughs> but at this point, it was like, I was like, okay, I will never wear pink and I will never wear a dress again. And yeah, it's, it's weird, but it's kind of true. I had a weird experience. Um, I mean, I had gotten my job on the unit through, through um, being an assistant, but uh, when I started to go out on meetings and had representation, I you go out on what are called general meetings where you just sort of meet and greet a lot of people in the industry, and I was 
you know, coming from the East Coast, it's, to it's normal that you would dress up and look nice for an interview. And so, yeah, I would wear like a skirt and I don't know, a blouse or something like dumb. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and after, yeah, no, exactly. And after a couple um, meetings, my agent called and it was so, and he was male and it was so awkward, I remember, because he was just sort of like, what are you wearing to your interviews? <laughs> Because I guess, like, I, I don't know, some executive had called him and sort of made fun of me or something. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. But it was like, but basically, like, in this odd way, you look, I looked like I was trying too hard or something is how it came across. And I do think in L.A. it is, like, it's very casual. I would say you certainly want to look presentable. It's not, like, great Schleppy to look sloppy. Yeah. But there is that weird feeling of, like... Authenticity. Yeah. L L.A. can be, it's, no, like, it's a very New York casual... Too. It's New York, too. Yeah. Because when I... I remember I stopped working on Law and Order. I did, I had a, I, it was a very hard job and I kind of had a bad experience and I decided I was gonna leave casting entirely because I thought people were horrible and un, and just unethical and like, uh, and evil and like how can these people be successful with what they're doing? Um, and I quit and I was like, that's it. Because, you know, because when back then, we didn't have any health insurance, paying for your own insurance. There was no email. Um, and I was looking in the paper for jobs. I was like, well, I need to get a job that has health insurance. You know, I was going to take the LSATs. Like, I didn't know. I was in a very questionable point in my life. And uh, <laughs> I uh, found in the paper, the BBC was hiring. <laughs> they had a BBC in, in New York. It wasn't even BBC America yet. It was just their office. And they were hiring executive assistants, which I had no qualifications for whatsoever. And... Um, and in casting, it, the, one of the reasons I love casting was you can go in like your sweatpants. You could literally go and cast in your pajamas. It does not matter what you have on. So, um, so I did this BBC job for literally like six weeks and you had to dress up every day and it was horrible. And it was like that. It was like you had to wear like a long skirt or like black pants and like a blouse you tuck in, whatever. It was like, in, again, the 90s. So, um, <laughs> And, uh, and I hated it. And so when my, my somebody called, El, I, the woman I ended up working for, Ellen Lewis, she called me. She wanted to meet with me. And my best friend, who was also a casting director, Marsha DeBonis, she's like, you know, Ellen wants to meet with you today. And I was like, um, I, it, was, it wasn't a day I was at the BBC. I was like, I can't come. I'm in jeans. I can't come, you know? And she's like, are you kidding? And I was just like, yeah, I have to put on like my long skirt, you know, for, <laughs> for a thing. And, and she's, like, she's like, oh my God. She was just like disgusted. She's like, fine, come tomorrow. And I get, got all dressed up and like, I walk in. Ellen's wearing like these jeans and she's smoking and she's just sitting there like whatever. And I'm like, oh God, I'm an idiot. Why am I wearing this skirt? And I've never worn a skirt since, so. But it is, it's a really weird thing when you're raised like, when you're raised like by professional people, you know, who do have to either wear a uniform to work or have to wear a suit to work or something, you just think, yeah, of course you're gonna supposed to, you're supposed to wear something, not your everyday jeans clothes to your job, you know? But that's not the case in, in this business at all. You know, maybe like PR people. Unless you're an executive. PR people, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have yeah, to look, if you're you have on to look, the executive side of the building, you have to look like fancy or something, yeah. yeah. You also, it's funny, yeah. I, I remember like going on meetings, to staffing meetings, you know, like Emily was saying, like you go on these general meetings and then hopefully they lead to meetings with showrunners. And there, I remember having like a transition where, of course I was always going on meetings and never getting jobs, so I was just <laughs> like, Okay, I'm I'm always wearing my meeting outfits and like I and I'd buy like one I'd buy like one or two outfits like if my parents came to town and visit I'd be like do you think we could go to like Limited Express and I could buy like a meeting outfit and I'd be like maybe two meeting outfits just in case like I could ever possibly have back to back meetings and um and then I just remember being like I'm walking into these meetings where I'm trying to sell myself and I'm dressed up in these like weird Limited Express outfits and I don't feel comfortable and I'm just gonna start wearing what I wear because. And it is, it's almost, I mean, it's like dating. It's like, mm -hmm. you, it's like you go in and you're like trying to be this like nice outfit person who's like professional and you should hire me and you're so enthusiastic and you want it so bad and they're like, oh my God. I remember interviewing a guy for Life Unexpected who I had interviewed with uh, and I remember I wore meeting heels. They were pink. This is all a disaster. I wore, I'm sure I wore pink meeting heels and a dress. Actually, I didn't. I wore this pink off-the-shoulder shawl that was also my meeting shawl. And um, I was so excited. I felt completely inauthentic because I don't even wear heels. And when I met with him on Life Unexpected, I was like, oh, my God, I know you. I met with you. And he goes, I remember you. <laughs> and he goes, you were really enthusiastic. <laughs> and first I was like, you know what, Dick? I was enthusiastic yeah. about your show. And why are you even here? I was so put off by it, but I was like, 
I did, I felt like I was so like hyped up in heels and like being this person that I wasn't and like so kind of like desperate. And then when you're just like, you know what? I'm gonna wear my fucking Cure t-shirt and my corduroys and I'm gonna go in my mm -hmm. flip flops and I'm just gonna be me. And it goes so much better. I mean, it's really good for anything in life. But yeah, they yeah. can tell when you're Take desperate the hose, too. Ladies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take off yeah. the hose. bras. Take off the bras. Yeah. They, 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 if they you're if you're a lady desperate. who's most comfortable, all dressed up, dress up. Do what yeah. they Oh yeah, if want. that's you. That's yeah. 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 I wonder if a guy is on this panel, of, like what their perspective. I'm curious what it would be. Um, wait, September. One more question. Uh, this hand is what I saw first. Okay, so all of you kind of mentioned feeling like, okay, I'm unworthy, <laughs> and you even said that it's even kind of like driven you to quit a few times. Um, how do you, like, I've interned and I've felt like, oh God, I'm the scrub of the earth. How do you, like, get through that so that it doesn't discourage you away? Like, how did you guys get through that process of being scrubs? <laughs> I mean, it's not, it really isn't fun. Like, I don't, I feel like being an assistant is just not great. Like, any, <laughs> I feel like it's, I've, I have yet to find the assistant who's like the lifelong, this is what I want to do with my life. I, I mean, it's, it's, and, and in well, like. it's a stepping stone, so you're always yeah. knowing there's yeah. got to be a point where you have to feel like yeah. you want to. I know for me it was a little bit like just having confidence or just knowing that you want, that I eventually wanted to be a writer, that it was like if I was dealing with something or someone said something or I had to get my like 1800th coffee of the day or whatever it was that it, that more just, it was like little mental notes, like when I am a boss or if I am ever in this position, this is what I will not be doing to somebody. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it, it helped and hopefully, you know. I overcompensate with my assistants so much. Like my parents have a problem with it because I'm so nice, overly nice to them and I'm like, uh, you know, and I'm not bragging or anything. It's like kind of a sick thing because it's like <laughs> I'll buy them presents and buy them lunch and be so nice. Be like, don't you don't have to rush in. Don't worry, because like I had to be in the office before my boss every single day, coming from Jersey. You know, <laughs> rushing in and it was torture and it was horrible and it was like we really didn't need to be in at that time. So unless there's something going on, like so that's what I do now too. It's just like I know I will never be like this when I'm the boss. And there is some kind of like there is some sort of. Um, it feeling you just feel it just makes you feel better about yourself that you went through all that and yeah. that you could get through all of it and you could still land on your feet and nothing can like bring you down eventually like you could do the worst to me you you know because I've gotten the worst and I'll still do my work you know I'll still be standing you know I think relying on yeah. um, I know for me I mean two things one kind of keeping an eye on the goal that you have mm -hmm. and not letting those things kind of bring you down. But I know for me, it was like relying on the other assistants. Like even when I look at hard assistant jobs and like difficult bosses, um, it's usually, I feel like everyone's experiencing their version e either in your office or at another job. And it's like, I mean, the assistants on Dawson's, we used to laugh so hard. We used to do crazy things. Like it would get insane. It's we your would therapy. Go, it's yeah, we your would go out to the stairwell and race each other up and down the stairwell until like people threw up. We would like order delivery from like Gil Turner's, this place that delivers alcohol. We would like play Office Survivor and vote people out of the office. Like we would, <laughs> you would just do like this is back when Survivor first premiered against Dawson's, and we'd all secretly watch Survivor. But, um, <laughs> but I think I think the camaraderie of of you know it, maybe it's kind of gallows humor, but you're relying on other people who are in the same boat. And I think it can actually make it really fun when you know you're not alone. And you look back on those stories that seemed so bad at the time when you're in your car crying because you mixed up FedEx and UPS and you're a moron. And then you're just like, and then you find out it was like some personal thing you did anyway and they shouldn't even been using the FedEx and it's just karma that some idiot put it in the wrong box anyway. And you're like, whatever. So it's just, it's just, you know, I think, I think it's the other people that kind of help you get through it. Yeah, and if you're alone, because when you're casting, you're alone because you're usually only like one you're assistant. you're screwed. You're screwed, but what you have is, and hopefully you have this and this is why you're doing Doing this is like you have to really be pa in this industry I think you have to be so passionate about what you want to do to the point where you know you'll you'll not Sneak do chairs anything, obviously and, yeah. you know because yeah. there's the limits obviously but you that yeah, you'll in, that you'll endure it you know and just quietly like accept it because someday you will have your vengeance and um, <laughs> and I really do think that that's a good motivator I do revenge is like an amazing thing you know <laughs> Oh, and yeah, I, I will say the sprocket hole person. Yeah, exactly. Came yes, to, a, yeah. met to be a director on Life on. It. She, 
submitted to be a director on Life Unexpected. And there was, of course, a part of me that was like, I should do it because that, and then I was like, no. I was like, that was hell. Like, no. And it's not to be like vengeful, but it's just there are other qualified great people. It's not like, yeah. But all assistants remember. That's the thing. I'm like, that was awful. I remember every actor, every agent, every person that was ever (laughs) horrible to me. And now when they call, it's like, you know, I, you know, you keep it inside. You don't act like a psycho and like, be like, really? Um, but, but you definitely, they, they have definitely screwed themselves in their past by treating you terribly, you know, so. Yeah, treat everyone almost like a future You always boss. treat assistants, yeah. assistants assistant like that. My assistant is going to be my future boss. Yes. Right, yeah. I, I know that now and I tell her that all the time. I'm like, so in 20 years when I'm like, when they're kicking me out and I'm like desperately trying to get a consulting gig, just hire me to remember that we loved each other once and feel bad for me. And I'm wait- and she- I've literally made her sign it on the dotted line because I know. Good job, good job. On the back of your Panda Express yeah. bag. <laughs> yeah, I had a boss once that say the biggest form of flattery is like having an assistant that surpasses you eventually because it's just it's a kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Um, well, that's all the time we have. Please give a round. Of applause.